So then I want to go ahead and move on to the next uh, McLuhan essay, <clears throat> or the next one after the next one. Uh, the next one that was published in uh, Explorations 3, I believe, uh, is not quite as uh, video friendly, I think. <clears throat> and it basically recaps some of the main points of the second essay. But it's the next essay that he does that he publishes in uh, the journal Explorations, issue number 6, that I want to go over <clears throat> in some detail here. Uh, it's called The Media Fit the Battle of Jericho. Now, we remember the myth of the Battle of Jericho is that uh, the Hebrews circled the city and they blew their horns and the sound uh, set up a resonance that caused the walls of the city to collapse and come down. And so what McLuhan wants to evoke in his discussion of the new forms of media in the 20th century are that the new electric media are bringing down all the walls, the walls between cultures, the walls between media, the walls between the arts and sciences, all the walls that have been erected throughout the course of the evolution of history, largely by writing, and especially by uh, mechanized, that form of mechanized writing known as print. Uh, so he wants to evoke that myth. And the interesting thing about this essay is it's the first time that we see the appearance, uh, it was published, I think, in Exploration 6, which is 1955, if I'm not mistaken, 56, 1956. And the, the key thing about this essay is that it represents the first appearance of the McLuhan-esque aphorism. He became famous for his aphorisms, and an aphorism is just a succinct statement that's compressed into a sentence or two uh, in which complex ideas have been compressed. And McLuhan later called them probes. They're probes because the medium is, is the message, is the most famous of his probes. Out of that phrase, you can unpack an entire philosophy. So he, he, McLuhan was the master of the aphorism, and uh, this essay is the first essay that he wrote to be composed of aphorisms. And so what I want to do is read through it, aphorism by aphorism, since the sentences are very short. Uh, it, kind of, it should lend itself to a rather breezy reading right through it. But then what I want to do is amplify these aphorisms as I go along, and I especially want to cross-fertilize his reading here of the evolution of the effects of media with my own miniature history of the book that I wrote in my uh, new book, The New Media Invasion, uh, which will deepen and enrich some of the historical background behind all this. Now the first sentence, the first aphorism is that he writes is that <clears throat> he says, the Western world is living through its own past and the pasts of many forgotten cultures. So right in that one sentence he's evoking uh, things like Spangler and Toynbee with their idea, their discovery. What Spangler says in The Decline of the West is that his philosophy of history is unique in that it discards the ancient medieval modern scheme, which he calls a Ptolemaic vision of history because it sees everything revolving around us, the West, with his Copernican model, which envisions history as a total of parallel historical timelines all moving at the same time each one moving in its own frame of reference. The Hindu history, the Chinese history, uh, the Faustian history, the Magian history, the classical Greco-Roman history. Each one is a sort of mosaic of a different culture moving in its own frame of reference. Exactly like Einstein's uh, Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, that essay came out in 1905, uh, which exhibits this idea of the breakdown of perspectival space into multiple perspectives with each object moving in its own spatio-temporal frame of reference, with time flowing differently for each object, and each object making its own space differently. So already here, uh, at the beginning of the essay, he's invoking this idea that we now coexist with multiple frames of reference. Uh, and so <clears throat> the advent of the electrodynamic world has complexified and diversified our culture now. And so we're having to deal with the effects of these new media. He says, print merely permitted a fixed stereoptic vision of the past, that is to say, a linear perspectival view, ancient, medieval, modern, everything leading up to us moderns as the great pinnacle of history. That, that has been scrapped here by this point. It's already obsolete by 1956, of course. Its imagery flow was much greater than writing or speech permitted, he says, but it was very far from the simultaneity that came with the telegraph, and which now characterizes all phases of our culture. So with the telegraph now, we have the plugging in of writing and the sending of electric current through it, and for the first time we have the rendering of simultaneity coming in, dissolving the first one thing, then another linearity of speech that is a habit of thought modeled upon the linear lines in a page of printed text, especially mechanized printed text, not just written text, but printed text as well. Um, then he says the, the telegraph gave us the global snapshot, which knocked out the walls between capitals and cultures, and created open diplomacy, or diplomacy without walls. 
And he's invo invoking, of course, uh, Andre Malraux's idea of the museum without walls. Photography creates a museum without walls by uh, taking images out of museums and putting them into books so that we can have them in our laps and don't have to go to museums anymore. Media is doing that likewise. Uh, radio and television is creating uh, a classroom without walls. We've got information coming in from everywhere, not just in the classroom. It's we're bombarded by an environment of information overload is the point that he wants to get across here. And so he says, <clears throat> the same state of affairs resulting from simultaneity of communication appears in our cities. Cities were always a means of achieving some degree of simultaneity of association and awareness among men. What the family and the tribe had done in this respect for a few, the city did for many. Our technology now removes all city walls and pretexts. So we have the idea of the walls coming down of these cities. Uh, this makes us think of the earlier talk about Heiner Muhlmann, where he was talking about with his maximal stress theory, maximal stress cooperation theory, uh, that in the modern age, with no walls around our cities, the cities now, the security systems in those cities now, are based on electronic saturation of the space, a total saturation of the space with electronic pulse signals. That now is the equivalent of what used to be the walls surrounding our ancient cities. The next aphorism, McLuhan goes on and he says, uh, the oral and acoustic space of tribal cultures had never met a visual reconstruction of the past. This is McLuhan's first use of the word acoustic now, acoustic space. And acoustic space is, of course, the space of the oral tribal world. It's acoustic because it's based on sound. And in the oral tribal world, knowledge exists only in its utterance. When you utter something, at the same time that you're uttering it, it is also evanescing and vanishing at the same time. And so in an oral culture, what you have to do is you have to have rote mnemonic formulae with repetitive, repetitive patterns of thinking. So you have things like parables and rhymes that help store knowledge in the memory and mnemonic codes, uh, the, the rhyming schemes of which, or the formulaic patterns of which, enable you to store the knowledge in the memory. And it's entirely oral and entirely acoustic. Uh, and, but he's also going to say that acoustic space is reconfigured with electric technology, starting with the telegraph, because it brings in this sense of simultaneity again, everything coming at us from all directions, electronic pulse signals bringing information in from all over the globe in a 360 degree radius to every individual no matter where he or she is at. It is a, truly a world without walls that, that started with uh, the telegraph. <clears throat> so he says, with the return to simultaneity, we enter the tribal and acoustic world once more globally. So now it's a global phenomenon, whereas before it was tribal and local. A primeval, uh, he says, as primeval man pressed on his acoustic walls and moved forward the visual orientation of experience, he discovered sculpture and painting as sculpture. Sculpture is halfway to architecture and writing. And then he makes a clarification. He says, sculpture is not the enclosure of space, as Renaissance art, Renaissance art is, with its perspectival space that pictures objects inside of an enclosed space visual space, the eye unifies space into a comprehensive whole. But in these earlier uh, oral tribal cultures, space is tactile and each object makes its own space. Uh, just as in Einsteinian electrodynamics, each object creates its own spatiotemporal frame of reference. So too, in the magical world, uh, the magical consciousness structure of preliterate man, space is enclosed by sculpture. That, that is space. He says it is the modeling of space. But to a purely acoustic culture, such a means of arresting visually the dynamics of acoustic space must inevitably, must inevitably appear as very astonishing. So with sculpture, he is, uh, the primitive man is visually arresting the dynamics of acoustic space by modeling it and capturing it in a, in a form of sculpture, which is highly tactile, of course. And tactility goes along with this oral acoustic uh, phase space in a very concrete way. The sense of sight has not yet come in to rupture and disrupt all the other senses. Purely acoustic space, he says in the next aphorism, the space evoked by the spoken word in a preliterate world is equally magical. The complex harmonic structure of the word can never be a sign or reference before writing. It evokes the thing itself in all its particularity. Only after this acoustic magic has been enclosed in the fixed written form can it become a sign. And so uh, this invites a certain comparison with Gene Gebser's uh, magical consciousness structure that he says was characteristic of the the primitive world, the world of tribal man, in which the entire world is a single point-like unity, in which if you know the magic spell, the spell can send out magical ripples all throughout this, the web of creation, since everything is thought to be intermeshed and interconnected with everything else, like a page out of the Book of Kells, which still 
uh, the, the page out of a book of Kells or an illuminated manuscript preserves this ancient mesh idea that all of spatio-temporal reality is interconnected. Nothing has yet been differentiated out. Worlds have not been pulled apart, space from time, the soul from the macro soul. All of that has not yet been differentiated in the primitive, uh, the aboriginal tribal consciousness uh, at that point. And he says, to capture the dynamics of the phonetic flux or flash in a fixed visual net, that was the achievement of our alphabet. Uh, I want to pause at this point to review the history of the book uh, and to review the advent of the alphabet and to put it in, into context at the point that it came in. Um, writing began in the city of Uruk, the ancient Mesopotamian city of Uruk. Uh, writing was invented in that city. Uh, Uruk was part of a twin set of cities, Uruk and Ur. Uruk became Iraq, which is now Iraq. The word Iraq pr preserves this original city of Uruk. Um, and uh, Ur was its twin sister city, and Ur was the city that was sacred to the moon god Nanasin, uh, whereas Uruk was sacred to a solar dynasty. Uh, Gilgamesh was one of its kings, and his forefathers were all descendants of the sun god Utu, so it's a, it's a solar city with a solar dynasty. And it is said that there is a myth even that uh, Gilgamesh's grandfather Enmerkar invented writing. And the myth goes that um, Enmerkar was leading a siege against the city named Arata, uh, to try to get them to produce metals for a rook. And he was sending a messenger back and forth over the mountains to deliver these messages to the king of Arata. And the messages kept getting longer and longer and longer and harder and harder for the messenger to remember them until finally there came a point where he could no longer remember the message. So this is an example of what McLuhan will later call the reversal of the overheated medium. And uh, in this case it reverses into writing because in Mercar's uh, solution is to create a clay tablet and write the message down and give it to him. And then so he takes it, uh, the messenger takes this to the king of Arata, who is of course illiterate, he can't read it and doesn't know what to make of it. But the point of the story is that he who has writing is superior to those who don't, and those societies that don't have writing must submit to the yoke of those who do. Uh, and that becomes the point of that myth. So writing was invented in a rook, and it was invented there about 3500 BC for strictly pragmatic uh, bureaucratic purposes. Uh, the priests in the temples wanted to keep track of the donations. Uh, you have donations coming in, people bringing in sheep and goats and grain from the provinces for sacrifices and offerings. And they wanted to keep track of this, so they invented writing as a system of record keeping. And what they did was they wrote on clay tablets. And uh, Mesopotamia is the only civilization that used clay as a medium for its writing because uh, on the river valley there it's resource poor. There's very little wood, very little metal, very little of anything. And so they used clay. And the first writing began as these little clay tablets that could be held in the palm of the hand, almost like a primitive iPhone, upon which uh, pictographic images were drawn with a curved reed stylus. So they would draw these little pictographic images in vertical columns, moving from, uh, moving from initially from right to left. Then at some point they rotated it, the whole thing, so that the vertical columns became horizontal, and that was so they didn't smudge the images with the, with the palm of the hand as they were writing. And so we got horizontal writing at that point, and they stopped doing the pictographs because the pictographs took too long to draw, and they brought in the, a, a wedge-tipped reed that they could just punch the images in with a little Morse code-like dots. Uh, and so this, this cuneiform writing, as it's called, is almost like a Morse code. You write it very rapidly with this complex series of wedges and dots. Uh, the, dots gra the wedges gradually become dots over time. Uh, and the sacrifice of that is uh, pictographic writing disappears and you get this very abstract script. And the tablets begin to become lar larger and larger and pretty soon they have to be stored on shelves in libraries. But the Mesopotamians don't start writing down anything like what we would call literature or mythology until about 2600 BC. So it's been in existence not something like 900 years before they start bothering to use it to record their myths and tales. And um, <clears throat> it very well may be the case that the Gilgamesh epic is the, the world's first complete book. It was written down on 12 tablets that were stored on the shelves in one of these libraries that told the, the legend of Gilgamesh. And these tablets were baked in kilns, and when they were baked in kilns, they could not be altered. So it was a very permanent style of writing. And the style of writing uh, on using a cuneiform on uh, clay tablets lasted all the way down to about the first century A.D., so it's an incredibly long-lived mode of writing. We're talking 3,500, 3,600 years of survival for this world's oldest book, medium. 
Now in uh, Egypt, on the other hand, at about the same time we have the invention of writing there, possibly a century or two later. First, with the incision of hieroglyphs on ivory uh, and bone plaques that are found in the tomb of the Scorpion King, dating, uh, this is to Dynasty Zero, this is even before the first dynasty, to about 3300 BC, and so it therefore appears in a funerary context, and these are the hieroglyph hieroglyphs uh, inscri inscribed on these little shards of bone and ivory. Then we get the, the advent, the great Egyptian innovation of the book was the, the papyrus scroll. Now the Egyptians had a monopoly on papyrus,